Okay, and with that, we're here today to talk about the um, Results Data Public in, Publishing Ethics uh, Working Group, which is a collaboration between Force 11 and COPE. Uh, and we're going to be telling you a little bit more as to what we've been up to in the last year. Uh, the structure is that we're going to give you a bit of background into the working group and the resources we have worked on. We'll post for any questions around that. And then I'm very pleased to say that we have uh, several of our working group members here today as well who will share their perspectives and experiences with the publication of results data and, and what they are experiencing there around ethics. And we hope to have time for questions in the final part. So again, a reminder to add questions in the Q&A field at any point during the session. Okay, so we're here to talk about uh, data publication and ethical challenges around that. Um, as you know, there's been a huge drive uh, to support data sharing over the last 10 years or so, uh, which we see as a very positive move. This has been supported by new policies, by funders, um, institutions, and also the implementation of data policies at different journals. And thanks to all of this, we are, we are seeing is a year-on-year -year increase in the data sets that, that, that get shared, which is very important because we hope to get to a point where we fully recognize data sets as results objects in their own right and provide credit to the data contributors and encourage data reuse. With the increase in the sharing of data, we are, what we are seeing is that with more data sets and more reuse, we are seeing more ethical challenges arising and, and, and a wide diversity of issues as well. Um, and a couple of years back, eight years back, I started to have conversations with uh, others in the community, including the speakers uh, in the call in the session today, uh, around the different issues that we were seeing and how probably we were all in, in the different members of the scientific community and those involved with data publication handling those in different ways and trying to grapple with those in our own uh, organizations and how it could be possibly be useful to leverage all of that knowledge and the experiences that we were seeing to try to get together and develop some uh, guidelines that would help everyone handle these issues as they as they arose. So this is part of the context that led us to um, get together for this working group. And I'm going to be handing over now to Daniela Lowenberg, who is the co-lead of the working group and is going to tell you more about that. Over to you, Daniela. Thanks, Aracha. Um, so as Aracha mentioned, bearing these issues in mind and kind of carrying some of the experience that's happening in the data world, it became clear that we needed a shorthand. Uh, we needed something that we were really shorthanding as COPE for data. So we needed best practices and guidance for repositories and publishers when these cases arise and these cases have come up. Um, and so we gathered an initial group of representatives from um, disciplinary repositories, publishers, and research integrity folks. And after putting together a straw man, we were able to launch this Force 11 group. And we chose Force 11 because we knew this couldn't be just done in a silo. It couldn't just be repositories or publishers or a community specific to that. It needed to be as diverse as possible because we need to include all possible stakeholders that could be involved in the handling of a data ethics case. So we also collected all the cases we had seen over the last few years as a small group and we anonymized them. So the working group could have examples, maybe 70 or so examples of the types of issues that we've all seen as data publishers. Um, and so the group's been live for nearly a year now, and we've been really focused on deliverables. We have over 70 members globally representing each perspective we need, and that's really to ensure that these recommendations are broadly applicable. For instance, we have federal disciplinary general and institutional repository reps. We have research integrity officers, research integrity managers at publishers, researchers, et cetera. And so this has been important, especially for the breadth in repositories, because we know that resources vary across our repositories and our recommendations have to be both attainable and responsible. Another big thing about this group is we have to have been very clear in our scope. This group has not intended to redefine data policies. We're not talking about data citation and other important pressing matters like that. For us to be as efficient as we've been, it's had to keep a very specific focus on integrity and ethics issues in publishing data. Next slide. 
So our working group members met each month and we chose specific categories of cases that were interesting to each of us. And then each month we broke out into Zoom rooms by category to discuss all the tricky things that could come up in that. And after a few months, we had a set of recommendations that we started grooming through. Um, and these really came into four categories of cases. The COPE trustees, and for those who aren't familiar, the Committee on Publishing Ethics, um, their board of trustees and the Force 11 board reviewed and endorsed the recommendations. And soon after posting in September to Sonoto, we also received endorsements from RDA and a recent piece went out just last week from the ISMTE president. So the goal right now is to make sure we get broad awareness of the recommendations and feedback because we need to think about how we're iterating on these. Even just the other week, we even found a case not knowing what category it goes into. So we want to take some time now to actually walk through what these recommendations are, both to illustrate, you know, what would a data ethics case look like, but also what the discussions have been like that we've been engaging in. Next slide. So the first is, is authorship. And in the majority, um, maybe not all, but many of data repositories are not asking co-authors for approval before publishing. So we should expect that there may be authorship and contribution conflicts that could arise post-publication. Um, and so next slide, some examples of these could be that a grad student was left off the date of publication, there's a dispute over ownership, that there's name changes. So this category is as similar um, as we really think it could be to, to journal publishing. Um, of course, though, that repositories are very different um, in our workflows. And so we had to bear that in mind. Next slide. The second category of cases is legal, and this is the most complex area of recommendation, and there's a lot of work remaining to be done here. This is also the least amount of expertise and capacity that we had in our working group to work on this. So we need to think about what resources may be available going forward, especially understanding that legal cases vary based on what country the authors are in and what country the repository that's hosting the data are in as well. And so these are um, quite tricky, but, um, next slide. These are broken down um, by licenses, um, by policy and regulation and other, and for each of those, there's many examples that we could go through, um, but at least to get some uh, high level steps around legal was an important thing for us to start thinking through who owns data, how is it handled, how does the license come into play, how does the country law come into play. Next slide. Then there's risk. So when we started discussing risk, we initially had two categories. We had risk to participants and risk to external communities. And we thought these were gonna be very different, but after drafting recommendations, we recognized that the workflows did not differ. Um, so we really went with an overarching risk. And then we have examples of two kinds. So you can see here, risk to human subjects. Um, and then next slide. We also have risk to, part, um, to the community. So that could be to species, to ecosystems, to society. Um, and these types of cases may be the most obvious in the data world. Um, this is, you know, could be publishing human information or publishing information that may be harmful to society if it's on the internet. Um, and these recommendations, we make nods to data curation being very important for fielding a lot of these things prior to publication. But we also have to understand that not all repositories have curation and these still may come up post publication. Next slide. And then the last category is rigor. And rigor refers to any issues regarding the validity or trust in the science. These cases are most often tied to journal articles where flaws are found in peer or post review. And the underlying data are in question, are flawed, are falsified, have gaps, are in incomplete. And it's important to note here in light of rigor cases that we do believe that data repositories are responsible for the curation of data, meaning ensuring data are usable, don't contain harmful information, have enough metadata. But peer review of data is a large question mark that needs to be solved. And so rigor cases that we've seen have mostly been caught post article publication. We hope to move to a state one day where the data are routinely analyzed and run during manuscript peer review. Um, but we also know that just even having data in repositories so that we can flag to the community if the data have rigor issues is a huge step going forward. 
So I'm going to pass it over to Racha, who's going to actually walk through rigor as an example of how the documents and recommendation looks. Um, but for each, I do want to note that the group recognized that handling issues about data sets does not necessarily mirror the process at journals. And so with that in mind, we have not included language such as expression of concern or retraction, which we didn't think was appropriate. Most all of the recommendations include a metadata or file update repositories. Some cases involve adding a note or a flag to the published data set, notifying readers of a related retracted article or concerns raised. And in rare, rare cases, will we actually take the data set down? So over to you, Aracha. Yeah, thank you so much, Daniela. We thought it may be useful to just go through one of the uh, documents that we have developed. Again, as Daniela has covered, we have four separate documents. It's for one category of the type of issue that you may see. Um, and we wanted to say just roughly how we structure this to try to make the resources as uh, concrete as possible and to provide practical guidance to anyone who may encounter these issues. So to start with, each of the documents have the information that Daniela just went through a little bit of information as to what is covered within that category and examples of uh, situations that may come up of the type of cases that you may hear about. Um, next, what we have in each of the documents is that we wanted to give a little bit of context as to how uh, data publishers may come across these situations, how from which sources this uh, may come, how they may be contacted. So we have for each of the categories, a section titled how cases may arise and there we, we provide a list of the different parties uh, or stakeholders that may contact the data publisher in relation to this type of situation. So it may be through the author who has spotted an issue or perhaps the, again, if there is any curation at the data repository, the data curator or a member of the team may raise it. Similarly, as part of the journal uh, editorial process, perhaps an editorial reviewer may raise the issue. Following that, we have, a, I guess, the meat of the, of the document is the recommendations for follow-up. Uh, and here what we did is um, uh, essentially structure this in a way where we would cover first situations that involve a data set that has not yet been published. It may be going again through the journal process or the data repository uh, process, but it's not available to other readers. Um, and so essentially here what we did is again provide some uh, recommendations to make sure that the, the data publisher that is contacted um, uh, follows up with the authors as needed and then the recommendations branch out into data repositories and journal publishers. Um, for data repositories, what we recommend is obviously, if, again, we're looking here at the data set that is not yet publicly available to try to resolve this with the author. There may, it may be possible for the author to provide a revised data set. If that is possible, encourage that path and then proceed with the data set. If that is not possible because there are issues that are too major to resolve, um, the recommendation here is that if the author doesn't by themselves withdraw the deposition that the repository should essentially close that submission, unless again, the, the author can come back later uh, with the issue resolved. Um, the path for, for journals is similar, but what we incorporate here is the fact that probably on the journal side, uh, there may be a, an editorial or review process that is ongoing. So when there is a concern about the rigor of the data set and how this impacts the the associated manuscript, the journal may wish to uh, undergo a particular step as part of the review process, get an expert to provide input, and with that inform their um, decision as to whether they pursue uh, the with the submission or not. And then, and then in a similar way, the author may be able to provide the revised data set, and that would be a, in the form of a revision, or if that's not possible, then either the, the submission would be withdrawn or rejected. Um, and for journals, what we do is that we know that COPE has already developed quite a bit of recommendation uh, in terms of follow-ups, and they have flowcharts specifically also for, for follow-up on data integrity issues. So we refer to those. We don't want to necessarily reinvent the wheel in terms of recommendations. If we turn to the situation that involves a published data set, we follow the same structure by breaking it down for both data repositories and journals. Um, and here, Similar steps as before, there should be a contact with the authors. If we are looking at repositories, a, a, a contact with the authors, 
to try to see if that can be a resolution to the issue. If a resolution uh, is possible, essentially if the author can provide an updated uh, version of the data set, what we recommend is leveraging any versioning tools available at the repository and then just posting a new version with the associated metadata as necessary. If the data set cannot be modified to address the issue, perhaps uh, the data set is incomplete, there are gaps, the data have been lost. Um, you may have all heard of these examples. Um, what we recommend here, which is uh, different from what perhaps those of you familiar with journals uh, may be familiar with, is that we recommend that the data repository issues a notification on the data set saying there is an issue and any user that comes to this data set and may be seeking to use it needs to be aware of perhaps what the gaps are or what the concerns are. And we took this step because we, we, we felt it was relevant to, to balance here the, the fact that also data should be permanent records and available, and also that they may be useful to answer other research questions compared to what the initial data contributor looked at. So there may be some value in having the data set there, but the important principle here is transparency so that any user seeking to, again, uh, reuse it for the research or cite it is, is aware of what the issues are. Um, or the one thing to mention here is that, that we, we did discuss that there may be some overlap sometimes between rigor and the risk considerations that Daniela was referring to. So we encourage repositories to think about that. And if there are any risk considerations, then move on to that category that has also specific follow-up for situations where you may need to consider removing the actual record. Um, on the part of journal publishers, as we mentioned earlier, there, there is an expectation that there was a peer review editorial process, so likely there is a process at the journal to do some post-publication review. There may be, again, uh, input sought from an expert who can provide advice as to how the issue with the data set impacts the publication overall and can advise as to whether the, the, the article should stand or not. If the issue can be resolved with a revised data set, uh, the recommendation here is for the uh, uh, journal to issue a correction that points to the updated data set and provides that context. If the issue cannot be resolved with a new version of the data set, then it's for the journal to, to proceed through their editorial process and make that determination as to whether they can stand by the paper or they should consider an expression of concern or retraction. And again, here we link again to the COPE recommendations because they cover quite a bit of this also in relation to correction to journal uh, article versions of record. Um, we also have, after outlining uh, those recommendations, some, some pointers as to how to handle this communication, because the issue with data sets is, as, I mean, we are talking about data repositories, uh, readers, journals, et cetera. So we, we wanted to have some advice also as to how to handle those uh, communications. Um, we recognize that what we recommend is that the party that gets notified uh, initially takes some steps within what is reasonable per the resources and framework to communicate to other parties that may be impacted. So for example, if a data repository is aware of a, of a concern about the data set and they know there is an associated article, if they can, that they pass that on so that the journal can decide how they should handle it. However, we recognize that we live in a world where there can be many research outputs associated with a single data set. There may be different articles by the original authors. There may be other authors reusing the, the same data set, et cetera. And it is not necessarily reasonable to expect that a data repository or a journal will always know what are all of the possible research outputs associated with an individual data set. So one thing that we highlight here is the responsibility of the corresponding author for that data set or journal submission to take the lead in, in leading those communications because they may have a better sense of, again, how many research outputs they have posted and shared and are impacted. Um, we also have a section as to how to handle the public notifications about the data sets. Again, I covered this briefly earlier, but it provides a little bit more detail. Um, the issue about, again, on the side of the repository, whether that you need to handle this through a metadata update or perhaps an editorial, sorry, public notification. And on the journal side, to again consider whether there needs to be a correction to the public record or some other option like a comment if the issue is minor and the commenting option is available at the individual journal. And then, very briefly, the last section um, includes. 
uh, some tips for situations where uh, any individual or party who is following on cases um, needs to communicate and interact with other parties and where maybe they are not getting all the information back that they need. We recognize these are complex cases often involve a lot of parties uh, and stakeholders and sometimes it's not always possible to everybody to follow up at the same pace. Um, but we provide here some advice as to if a particular stakeholder, say a data repository needs to take a decision, is not getting responses, but what to do, and also some guidance as to when to also raise issues to the attention of institutions. It tends to be a serious step, but can be a very valuable one also because institutions are an important stakeholder in data sharing, and we are going to be hearing more about that from our other speakers. So this is essentially the framework for all of the documents. So if you go to any of the other documents, they follow a similar path. And I just wanted to then come back and also tell you a little bit as to the what we are plan what the things that came up uh, as part of our conversations and what we are planning next. Um, a few items to highlight in terms of uh, the discussions that we had leading to these uh, documents. Um, one of the things that came up in several discussions is that we cannot necessarily just transpose all of the workflows and processes from journals, which have a you know, long tradition of dealing with these issues already, to repositories, because again, the internal workflows are different. Not every repository has curation, and also the resources will be different. So that's something that we try to incorporate. I'm not saying that we had necessarily the perfect balance, and I'd be interested in hearing from, from the attendees as well as to what they think around that. As Daniela mentioned earlier, um, legal cases, very complex and often go beyond, even at journals, go beyond what the editors can cover. You know, they need advice from uh, legal counsel, et cetera. And the complexity here is that often, again, as, as Daniela mentioned, it depends on, on which country the operation is running and which is the framework that applies to. So I expect that we will continue the conversation on this as frameworks develop. Um, terminology and definitions and how do we correct the record? What do we call notifications? Um, this is something that we also discussed. Again, it, there is quite commonly accepted terminology within journals. This is all relatively new for repositories. I'm not sure we necessarily can transpose everything to data repositories, but again, something where we will continue the conversation. But, you know, retraction, usually we think about the process as for the peer review and editorial decision, and that's, that doesn't happen at repositories. So should we call it the same thing? I have some doubts. Um, and then they mentioned that they mentioned about communication and um, within the open channels of communications are important. How do we balance this versus the resources and how to have forums that facilitate this? I think, again, is something that we will need to consider in the future and continue exploring to, to facilitate uh, that exchange. Uh, very briefly, in terms of what we are doing next, you've seen the, the recommendations, and I see that someone posted on the chat the, the link to Sinodo, so thank you for doing that. Um, what we are working on now is we want to develop flowcharts for each of the documents to have something more you know, visual for anyone who needs to handle this in the day job, and they know you, it guides them through the different steps. And the next resource as well that we will work on is to develop some policy templates for both the, uh, data repositories and publishers to guide them as they uh, develop or update their existing policies in terms of, of, uh, of reference for their users. Um, there may be other gaps in terms of guidelines and resources that we haven't thought of or we are not working on. So again, please do share comments and feedback if you have any uh, on, on any areas that you think uh, further work would be useful. Okay, I think this is what we had for the resources. So I want to pause and see if there, if there was any comments or questions from attendees. Um, Raj, it looks like we have yeah. two questions. I think mm -hmm. that they would be good for the rest of the panel though. So I think we can okay. wait until after Jürgen Rene. Um, but if, if anyone has, we'll give a last second, <laughs> see if there's anything specific you want to ask right now. Okay, I think maybe yeah. we can move on. And also, again, we'll keep an eye, so we feel free to also post on the chat, and we're happy to interact through, through that. Right, so shall we then move on? We're going to be hearing from the working group members. Daniela, over to you. 
Yeah, so um, we are very excited to have three different perspectives um, from the group today. Um, and we're gonna start off uh, with Jörg. And Jörg is at the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab and I'll let you take it from here. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Daniela and Eracha. Um, yeah, I'm, I like to emphasize um, just a view from the research institutions um, because I'm, I'm the research integrity officer of um, Berkeley Lab, so I'm, um, I'm, I'm involved on that side. Um, and, and from my perspective, ethics considerations for data sets are part of what we do as institutions. Um, it's something that we need also uh, need to take care of as part of our institutional stewardship uh, around research integrity. And um, I've also seen in the last couple of days, there were a couple of universities that published open science policies, which is fantastic. Um, but those policies also obviously come always with responsibilities as well. Um, uh, in, part in particular, also because the research data is often owned by institutions. So the data, I mean, not always, but some of those data sets that are problematic are actually concerning data that's owned by an institution. Um, so institutions also have a role or um, a responsibility in, in um, assisting or, or working with repositories on, on those aspects. Um, and obviously, they can also educate and train researchers in making sure that uh, nothing gets inadvertently published or, or what the criteria usually are. So that's that's something that, that um, yes, an institution can also provide. Um, and obviously, we, sh we should also be points of contact in case of problems. If if a repository or, or publisher or journal has has questions in the same way as they would have with uh art, journal articles and uh, they should be fine in contact, contacting an institution at, at Lawrence Berkeley lab there would be me as a research integrity officer and 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 those kind of contact details are online uh, but it's important that institutions also provide this for for research data um, and the other aspect the second aspect from the institutional perspective is that actually institutions often host public data sets and art repositories uh, so we have several repositories at Lawrence Berkeley lab and some of them are run by, by researchers um, at, at staff and, and, and then more like volunteer kind of efforts with few resources. Um, so those kind of workflows that this working group is developing are extremely useful because not all repositories are like big one with dedicated staff. Um, there, there's a lot of smaller ones and, and, and sort of achieving uniformity in the handling of uh, situations is, is important and also helps with the researchers and for, for that, for, from that perspective, these kind of flow charts and, and, and guidelines are, are really useful or will be really useful, I, I feel. Um, and, and the last part is obviously then also the question, do institutional policies adequately cover those scenarios? Um, are there, is there like a workflow? Is there a responsibility an institution if, um, if something comes up and who handles that? Who is the point of contact? And that's, I think, something for institutions to think about and to consider as well. Um, usually research integrity officers may not necessarily be trained or, or you know, given that responsibility. Most often the research misconduct policies are around journal publishing um, and, and don't extend beyond that. So I, th I think that's also something that institutions need to cover in, in terms of their policies. Thank you. Thanks, Eric. Um, so next up we have Renee, who is research integrity at PLOS. Hi, thank you so much for um, having me here today, Danielle and Aracha. And I am following up, I lead the publication ethics team at PLOS and wanted to mirror York's perspective with the journal publisher's perspective. Um, in many cases, the data underlying journal articles, they may be included uh, with an article's supporting information or they may be linked at a public repository or even available upon requests from researchers. But wherever those data are, they're really central and core to supporting the primary research that's included in an article, that's reported in an article. And unsurprisingly, as open, as open data principles are increasingly adopted, the data sets are receiving more scrutiny from uh, researchers, from readers, um, as people are looking to reuse and re-examine those data. And the new guidance certainly is, does a nice job of complementing what the COPE resources that are available. And in fact, they cross-reference over to the COPE resources in some places and will help to inform consistent efforts to addressing those concerns. At the journal level, we see a number of data ethics issues. These comprise a substantial proportion of concerns that are raised to us. And these cross all four of the 
uh, categories uh, that are represented in these flowcharts. So we see a number of issues around data ownership, around authorship, uh, permissions to publish or permissions to use data sets, um, breach of contract with regard to third party data, errors, data integrity issues, even research ethics issues that have implications for the use or sharing of data. And we follow up in accordance with COPE and look forward to having these uh, guidance documents also incorporated into journal follow-up workflows. One of the major strengths of this particular working group, which uh, Aracha and Daniel have highlighted, is that um, it really crossed uh, organizational boundaries and included stakeholders from different groups, um, different across the industry. And this is really important given that the research output, outputs of a given project tend to bridge multiple venues. We have protocols, preprints, data sets, multiple articles that all may stem from a single project. And so communications across our organizations can help us to ensure that any issues that arise are comprehensively addressed across the scientific record. It can also help us to avoid duplicating efforts. For example, if an, if an issue were to be raised both to a repository and to a journal, do, you, do we need both entities to follow up independently or can we combine our efforts? Um, and overall, the, the aim here is to keep problematic content from being orphaned in the scientific record, keep problematic content from being reused or further disseminated. And these, uh, these documents, when, when doing so, it's important to bear in mind that these different research outputs, they're linked, but they're also outputs in their own right. And so and even in follow-up to the same concern, a different action may be warranted. For example, an article's retraction doesn't necessarily mean that the data set is invalid and vice versa. So these guidance documents are represent, a, in my mind, a, a great first step towards uh, informing consistent efforts across industries and supporting collaboration across different stakeholders. But I think there's still a, a fair bit of work still to do, um, including those that uh, were mentioned earlier in terms of next steps by the working group. But one of the first steps really is raising awareness of best practices and ethics standards in data publication and even sharing information about these new documents. And a lot of um, what we need in some regards is, is to slight, make slight adjustments in how we follow up on these things. And this can be sim as simple as adding steps to workflows to have additional communications across organizations. Uh, as uh, Jörg and Daniela also alluded to implementing policies that address data publishing ethics issues, and one of the things that we encounter uh, with some regularity is looking around the globe at institutions, at publishers, and at repositories, it can be difficult to find contact information. And so a very simple way of supporting cross-industry efforts would be to uh, encourage groups to post contact information publicly so that it's clear who to contact with ethics and integrity queries. So with that, I will stop. Thank you. Thanks so much, Renee. Um, and then lastly, Amber, are you available? Yes, hi. Great. Take it away. Can you hear me? Yep, all good. All right, thank you. Um, firstly, I would like to uh, thanks to Force 2021 and Irasha and Daniela for having me here. I will introduce myself. My name is Amber Usman, and uh, I basically the advocate for best practices in scholarly communication and open science. Uh, currently, I have a project uh, with Creative Commons uh, that is Open Glam. So, uh, you know, advocacy for open science and open knowledge has been my domain since a few years. And coming back to uh, today's uh, agenda of deep dive that uh, today's presentation, which is on the recommendations on research data publishing ethics by Force 11 and COPE Working Group. And uh, you know, as explained by the leads and other speakers before me, uh, I don't have actually the presentation. I don't know, I was having some issues with uh, attaching the presentation. So I would just um, talk uh, about it. So uh, I think that these recommendations once into practice by COPE will genuinely uh, aid in handling data related editorial processing issues. 
from uh, the journal management perspective and from the publisher's perspective. And most importantly, researchers uh, who are very much reluctant in sharing the data as identified in the recent press release of Open Access Scholarly Publishing Association in aspect to COVID-19 research freely accessible. I think that these guiding principles uh, uh, once, uh, 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 you know, uh, us through the Committee on Publication Ethics will help them to gain trust and ease that uh, there are standard guiding principles and the journal and uh, repository policy templates which are being uh, in, you know, which are in progress right now. If they're also added on to the standards, then the researchers will be uh, much towards increasing the sharing of open data. And I guess that uh, retractions, which are due to the copyright issues, uh, due to the stolen data aspects can also be reduced. And of course, uh, at the end, which everybody has outlined right now, highlighted right now, right now that uh, working together in the publishing ecosystem will basically help us to genuinely uh, work towards this uh, greater portfolio. And uh, it's, I think, more needed nowadays because with uh, the pandemic having and the climate change issues, we need more data openly accessible. And uh, I think that's about it. Thank you. Thanks so much, Amber. Um, so I think I see that there's some questions coming in. I think we have just a few um, questions we wanted to go through with everyone first, and then we'll run through all the questions coming in here. So um, continue to populate those. Racha, do you want to kick off with the first question for the panel? Do you mind taking this, Daniela, if you have it in front of you? No <laughs> um, great. So the first question for the three of you, um, what is the biggest risk for the stakeholder that you're representing if data publication ethics are not prioritized? And you don't have to answer for everyone, but just for your, from your perspective and your stakeholder. Um, so maybe let's start with Renee. Uh, I think these data ethics, data publishing ethics issues cross so many different areas of risk, um, ranging from legal risk to personal risk, um, to risk to the scientific community, it's really quite broad, and I think it would be really hard to pick one of those as being the most important. But one of the things that I see as, as a one of the biggest aspects of risk is that if it's left unattended, then it will continue to grow. And if a data publishing ethics issue is not addressed, then that data set may continue to be reused and people continue to build upon that, which could have a ramifications for the scientific community that is using that work, or if it involves um, the release of sensitive data that shouldn't be shared, then that sensitive data will be more broadly shared the more it's used. And so I think that sort of multiplication and expansion of issues is one of the biggest uh, risks that I, in my view. Definitely. Your or Amber? Yeah, I mean, yeah, there's, 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 there's different risks associated with data. So you, it could be either you violate um, privacy um, of or release patient information, so or export controls, so, so those kind of things. Um, but I think taken together for an institution that obviously impacts the reputation and, and the trust in the work done at an institution um, as well. So it's, it's um, part of um, an institution's responsibility to make sure that um, sort of the outcome of, of the work um, that's being published um, has integrity and, 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 um, and does not violate any norms or laws or, or, or regulations. Um, so I think, uh, yeah, not, not addressing any risk or addressing concerns with the data set, um, as Rene says, amplifies this and, and, and also you know, has, has potentially a detrimental impact on, on the researchers and, um, and the institutions overall. So I think it's very important that those kind of questions are addressed in the same way as issues with journal publications. So another, another item that we have touched on on different points where we wanted to maybe spend a few more minutes on 
um, was this aspect of communication across different parties, again, different, given that there are so many actors in the space, um, Rene made a very uh, tangible and concrete suggestion um, to provide context, you know, that always makes it that extra a little bit easier. But I wonder if you have any further thoughts as to how we can best handle that element of communication between parties also so it doesn't become this onerous chain of emails that everyone needs to think about and um and also because obviously for example in the working group we provide a little bit of a forum to interact but we want this something that is easy for every repository every institution every journal so i just wonder if you have any other thoughts apart from providing contacts which is a very uh, easy win, but any other thoughts as to how we can try to improve that communication between parties involved in data publication? Maybe, um, Rene, if you want to start from there, and the other panelists can. Sure. Um, so I think there's, I give two answers. Uh, one is I think that on one hand, there's just an awareness issue of an awareness of a responsibility going beyond your individual output. Um, I think that a lot of, for example, journal workflows end with, you know, you've, you complete your work on the article, you may notify the institution, you close the case, but adding the step of, are there other outputs that need to be considered or even having a discussion with the corresponding author about that could be uh, very valuable, but it just requires an awareness that that would be an important step. Um, but sort of in, in thinking about it large scale, it would be great to have some element of notification done in an automated way in the way that, you know, the Crossref includes updates to articles, to journal articles, if there was a similar way of having alerts associated with um, linked outputs, that would be amazing, but it would require those outputs first to be linked to begin with. So it would be a few steps down the road, but it would be nice to have some sort of system by which it could be automated. Mm -hmm. Um, Daniel, I just wonder from the perspective of a data repository, what, was your, what, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I think it's tricky. I know that um, we did a panel on this at COPE and this came up and something that I mentioned was we were very fortunate at Dryad that we are so integrated within the publishing world and with journals, but the majority of repositories are not. And so how do we find ways for repositories to know what the you know related article is? But really the bigger issue is um, data can be mirrored. It can be everywhere. Data can be underlying 100 articles. So um, as much as it's important that we figure out how repositories and publishers during the publication process have better communication, especially for the disciplinary repositories and the publishers, um, but what else happens after? What do, you know, at what point do we give up that control that we don't know, say data and dryad CC0 could be anywhere on the internet. Um, what is the remit? What's the responsibility? And how do we go about having better communication lines between all those who are mirroring content or all the places that it could be? And one big step as always the plug I like to do in any talk is data citations. <laughs> It'd be great to have a better sense of where the data are being cited so that we can have a better idea of um, where if there's issues with the data, there might there could be issues with the article. But Amber, I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on that as well. Yes, uh, I was just wondering that uh, maybe we can have, uh, because we have manuscript submission systems and different kinds of, and now we do have different APIs which are connected, integrated into that manuscript submission system. So uh, maybe there can be a way that we can connect uh, different repositories, different publishers who already have that submission system can be integrated and they can be you know, notified, informed, uh, once the author uh, goes through the initial checklist of the manuscripts and the, you know, depositing, because it has been also highlighted because the preprints are low. So if we can also have a submission system in which the author can first, you know, initially submit the preprint and then the flow goes on with the actual manuscript which is submitted. So maybe uh, something like that could be, you know, uh, adding value to the communication with all these stakeholders. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Uh, so we wanted to make sure there was a bit of time for the questions from the audience and I see a few had come through. So thank you so much to all the attendees for participating. Maybe we'll start with the first one from uh, Maria, uh, who is asking, 
are authors allowed to repost the same data in a different repository? I'm interpreting this as in multiple repositories. So I think, Daniel, I think I'm going to start with you. <laughs> I, the short answer is it depends on the license. So it depends on the license of where the data were initially published and who owns the data. But I don't know if that might be enough for that. Maybe others can post in chat if they have other ideas on that. Maybe we can start to move through the other questions. I know I'm conscious of time. <laughs> I mean, I find this interesting because I, I work in um, in the space of preprints and it comes up all the time. And one of the things that we say that if you post in different places, you may split citations and lose track a little bit. Um, okay, let's see. Uh, there is a question from Jane as to whether, uh, is there sufficient awareness across institutions on how to deal with these issues related to outputs uh, so outside of formal publications? We're all used to the journal article, but now we have so many other things. Um, if you could recommend one thing to research academic institutions to do to respond to this, um, to the gaps and the policy, what, what would the recommendation be? Uh, Jörg, maybe starting with you from an institutional perspective. Yeah, I should say institutions are there. Um, I think the problem is sometimes that the different responsibilities for different issues with the data are in, are in different corners of an institution. So if it's like IT security or, or patient information or, or those kind of things, um, what an institution can do is, is just um, work and see whether they have workflows and policies set up um, that comprehensive, comprehensively look at this. And that's something actually we're doing at Berkeley Lab right now. Um, and we brought together like a working group within our lab that brings together the different stakeholders. And it was interesting from, for me to see how, how that communication between like info IT, um, research integrity officers, legal and, and others, how that communication actually helped in, in sort of bringing up the questions and formulating a workflow and policy that's, that's kind of in the works. And I think um, that's potentially useful for institutions bringing together those kind of stakeholders and, and creating appropriate workflows and policies for that. Absolutely, so the power of communication. I just wonder if any of the other speakers has any recommendations for institutions, you know, from your from your side of things. I don't have. I'm, I'm not going to give a specific recommendation, but I just wanted to comment that working with institutions around the globe, one of the things that um, is pretty clear is that there's a lot of variability in how these issues are addressed. Um, and sometimes in, in how easy it is to contact someone, but also in terms of the types of processes that take place or the types of recommendations that come back to the, to the publishers. And so I think there's a, a world of opportunity there, but also a very difficult question to, to answer given the different cultural and um, resourcing issues involved. Um, but I don't know if you have any further suggestions um, about awareness um, mm -hmm. uh, about integrity and ethics like uh, in our country I'm from like I'll just give an example I'm from Pakistan so what we do basically that we follow COPE religiously we uh, our government of Pakistan's uh, uh, on board institution which looks after the affiliations and accreditations of the higher education universities that is Higher Education Commission of Pakistan, they basically follow COPE guidelines. And we, uh, with the help of the COPE guidelines, basically, we tend to give awareness on different cases, on different, you know, aspects, whether we have it. And we do have a forum that we discuss all these issues so that we avoid such uh, malpractices in the scholarly research communication. Thank you so much. Uh, let's see, I saw a few further comments. Um, from the attendees. Uh, oh, I, I see a remaining question about um, uh, the all important resourcing for all of these processes. We, it's all good to have, you know, aspirations for integrity, but someone needs to resource this. Um, so this anonymous attendee is asking, what are your thoughts on how to financially support the processes that will be required to make all of this a, a reality. 
Any thoughts? I mean, we, we, we have covered also that not every repository has curation, so probably maybe that may be a step, but this also has financial implications. What, what are your suggestions or reactions to this? I can say that I think um, I think a lot of this is happening already. And I think at publishers and institutions, as Renee and York have said, and I think at repositories, it's a bit of this is already happening, which is just being responsible when you're responding to one of these situations coming up. And so this doesn't all require having resourcing. Um, it just requires being committed to being a responsible publisher. So even if you're not going to put in all the policies and do data curation and other things, knowing that if a case does arise, um, that you would respond to it and want to follow the recommendations. From there, it really goes up in resourcing of how much you would want to do around this and what kind of checks you want to put in and communications lines that you want to build with institutions, publishers, and others. Um, but I think that in general, it's really just making a commitment to wanting to handle everything as responsibly as possible and having some guidance to do so now. Um, as I think, you know, everyone really wanted to be responsible is kind of just like, what steps do we take? It's perhaps also, I mean, pre preparing data sets for publication and curating them, that's that's also a lot of responsibility and a lot of work. And if there's an oversight, that's how maybe sometimes errors come into data sets that need to be rectified after after they're posted. Um, so but so that that takes time and effort. And I guess that's more like a question also for research funders, whether they allow um, sort of line items in, in, in grants, in research grants that um, care for, for issues like, uh, OK, you want to publish your data. Here's, we also give you provision for curating and, and preparing that and storing it in the right way. I think that I think you're raising a great point there about the element of so if I'm a founder and institution, I have a policy. Uh, probably I should provide also the tools and the resources, like the data management plans, education, you know, and all the support uh, procedures, procedures at institutions. I think librarians are getting into this space and doing a fantastic job. Is that often researchers don't really know that they have that support available. Um, I mean, obviously, resourcing is always a bit of a tricky one because it, yeah, there are financial considerations and training. I guess that one of the hopes I personally have from uh, all the work that the working group is doing on the resources is that by building this uh, common knowledge about these cases and having consistent workflows, hopefully, we reduce some of the resource requirement because it's easier to just go on that on ground that having to reinvent the process every time and you know, having to, to have multiple communications, et cetera. But any any other thoughts on this or any aspect of, of the processes? Okay. Um, I see a remaining question about the element of STEM and, and other disciplines, which I think is very relevant. But I, I was going to mention, we have to always mind the gap. We, I think all of the speakers here, but mostly or at least myself, Daniela, Rene, and, and Jörg, come from the STEM perspective. And it's true that we should take that into account that there may be different considerations. Um, I guess that my, my main thing that comes to mind from there is that we, we our working group is open to everyone. And I think we want to encourage participation from different disciplines. So uh, if there is anyone here who has ex expertise from the social sciences and humanities, either as a researcher or from the journal side of things or institutional, we encourage you to, to also consider joining uh, the group because we will need that also uh, taking into account into the conversation. Um, and also, I, I'm not sure if I mentioned it earlier, but the resources are publicly available. They are CC BY essentially reduced them, but we are also very happy uh, to have feedback on all of the documents that we already put out and the resources that we will uh, share that are coming from the flowcharts and policy, etc. So we are very happy to review any comments if there are gaps, things that don't apply to some disciplines that we should nuance because the working group is going to be taking that into account for any revisions that we need to, to do to the, to the documents going forward. Okay, I realize we're coming uh, close to the time and I just wanted to uh, give a break. Well, obviously thank everyone for attending and to our fantastic speakers, but we had just, um, again, a reminder 
for everyone that the and it ties to what I was saying is now uh, the working group is open you can join uh, we have a page on the uh, for Silverman uh, website hopefully it's coming up yeah um, so we are happy we have a broad representation but again we cannot necessarily claim that we cover every perspective we're always happy to have additional perspectives so if you're interested you can join through the uh, force 11 uh, website you need to join force 11 but as i mentioned membership is free feel free to contact me or daniela if you want to hear more as to how we operate we, we have monthly calls and then you know we interact through email and slack but if you want to hear more Please let us know. We're always happy to have those conversations and, and additional contributors. And if you have any feedback on the recommendations, again, do take a look at Senodo um, and let us know if you have comments. It's been fantastic to have an opportunity to share all of our work here. I think we have done a fantastic job with everyone in the working group. I want to do a shout out to our working group members who are fantastic to work with. Um, we wouldn't be here sharing all of these resources without their uh, enthusiasm and contribution. So thank you so much. Um, I hope this was useful and that we will see many of you looking through the documents and implementing them into your workflows or letting us know what they may not fit into your workflows. Um, and with that, again, thank you, everyone. We're going to close this session. There is another session coming up, so do check on the log um uh, for the next session and yeah hope to cross you in another of the discussions at the conference thank you so much for participating bye for now